Thank you. Is it working? Is it, yeah. Anyone hear me? Cool. All right. Um, yeah, today I'm going to be talking about user onboarding for WordPress plugins. Um, so I'm going to be talking about what I mean by user onboarding, um, how to identify issues with onboarding, um, and how to fix them. Uh, so before we get started, I've been introduced already, but yeah, my name is Mike Jolly. Um, I'm from the UK. Um, I work for Automatic, and I'm the lead developer for WooCommerce. Um, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter <laughs> if you want. Um, so yeah, getting started, what do I mean by user onboarding? So onboarding is about getting your users familiar with your own products, um, trying to get rid of that feeling of what the hell do I do next? Um, it's the intersection between selling, educating, and using your product. So um, selling the product's advantages, um, educating users, and um, just getting them to a stage where they can use the product naturally. Um, all of this is done whilst actually using the product. Um, so things like documentation, forums, um, direct support, none of that really counts because um, they rely on external resources and it's more reactive. Um, someone only comes to you for help after they've got stuck already when using the plugin. Um, so yeah, we're focusing on passive help inside the product itself. In terms of how you implement it, um, on modern isn't about installing training wheels, it's about getting people to ride about them. So you're not just adding an intro tour and being done with it, you're actually trying to engage users and make them more proficient with your software. Um, it can be ongoing, for example, um, six months down the line you introduce a new feature and you onboard them into that new feature. Um, essentially, any time there's an opportunity to increase the likelihood that users are successful when trying to adopt your product is when you can onboard. Uh, but why? Why is onboarding so important? Well, Samuel Hulick from useronboard.com worded it perfectly when he said, a poor onboarding experience makes every part of a product company work harder. Market and teams have to acquire more and more visitors to keep filling a leaky funnel, and sales and support teams have to spend their days hand-holding confused sign-ups. Um, so basically what this translates to is a poor experience equals lost users and more support. Um, onboarding isn't just about the difficulty of your software either. It's also about um, showing the users the perceived value, uh, changing the users' perceived value of your software. So, if you show the users the benefits of using your product early on, they'll be much more likely to stick around, and they may even be more forgiving of any complexities along the way. So, about WordPress plugins, well, usually when someone activates a WordPress plugin, all they see is plugin activated and this doesn't tell them what to do next or give them any help. This is not very helpful. Um, so we could say that most plugins have poor onboarding. Um, some of you may be thinking, well, read the manual, but it's not really a good option because it's a hassle. Most users probably won't. They'll just go straight to the forums and this puts extra strain on the rest of the company. Um, Nate Munger said, what happens right after sign up makes or breaks any web product. Well, for plugins, what happens right after activation makes or breaks any plugin. Um, because you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. So if the onboarding process is difficult or horrible, um, users will remember that and this is going to reflect negatively on your products over, over time. And um, worse, they could even tell their friends. That is crap. <laughs> Um, so keep in mind your job isn't just to provide code, it's to help people use it and do awesome things. With a simple setup and showing the user the obvious benefits um, equals happiness. So how do we identify issues? Um, so you should look at pain points in the support areas, um, look for common issues, anything setup related. Um, ask users for feedback. You can do surveys and polls, ask them what went well and what do they struggle with. Um, you can do user testing. Um, so watch you, real users use your plugin for the first time. Um, if you cannot find like willing volunteers to watch and store, you can use a service like usertesting.com where you uh, pay a small fee and um, someone will run through and video themselves and you can ask questions and get feedback. Um, user testing has been really useful for us at WooCommerce, telling us what people are struggling with. Um, for example, recently we found that a few users have actually been struggling with the custom fields meta box, which is default to custom post types because they're thinking it would do something to the products on the front end or um, add information. Um, so the plan there is to just hide this by default in 2.5 just to remove that confusion. 
another user test showed um, users skipping over important options. Um, so in our notes, uh, we had, he got tired of seeing the admin notice reminding him to install WooCommerce pages and presses the, presses the skip button instead of the install pages button. Um, for a plugin like WooCommerce, this is a problem because our pages kind of are what's needed for the store on the front end. So this user is going to come into issues um, when he goes to actually set up his store. Um, so this led us to simplify the process, which we'll talk about later. Um, so let's look at some ways to improve user onboarding. Um, some of these are just from experience. Some of just examples I've seen in the wild. Um, not all apply to all plugins out there. I mean, it really depends on the complexity and the target audience of your plugin, but most can be adapted in some form. Um, so number one, you can present next steps. So after install and think about what the user should be doing next. Um, let's take an e-commerce plugin, for example. After you install and activate an e-commerce plugin, there's literally hundreds of things you could do. You could look at orders, set up your store, create products, um, create coupons. It's just, there's just loads of stuff you could do. And when in reality, all we want them to do is activate, set up their store, create a product, and sell something. When left to their own devices in a new space without any sense of direction or purpose, many users can feel lost, overwhelmed, and confused about what they're supposed to be doing there. So we should guide them from the start. And one way we can do this by offering visual feedback. Um, so if a plugin just works, give the, uh, give the user an indication that it's working. Don't just leave them guessing or searching for sentence pages. Um, if a plugin relies on being set up correctly, for example, it requires API details, and validate the setup's done before things break. Um, an example of this would be, say, a USPS shipping extension where you have to put in your API key. It pings USPS right away. If it fails, it tells the user, rather than them going to ship something later on and finding things are broken. Um, if there's any dependencies, make sure the user's aware and offer them shortcuts to install those dependencies if possible. And if menu menus are buried or setup is required, um, tell the user where they need to go. A quick example, Jetpack plugin. You can't actually use it until you connect to WordPress.com, so it shows you the massive banner. Um, the user connects to WordPress um, straight away. Another example, WordPress SEO plugin. When you activate uh, WordPress SEO, it prompts you to connect to various services, set up certain aspects of your SEO, um, all in admin notices. Some people might find this kind of thing annoying. For uh, example, <laughs> <laughs> Barry, Barry Coy mate, released um, WP was it Notification Center last week, which hides all these notices. Um, but to a user who has no clue about WordPress or plugins or SEO in general, um, it's pretty much essential to get the most out of the plugin. Um, using admin notices in plugins is pretty, pretty simple. Just um, have to hook into the admin notices action and hook in a function which outputs a notice. So in this case, we're just outputting the hello world. Um, and you can use class names like updated, error, and is dismissible. And these just change the appearance of the admin notice in the admin area. So for a real-world example, um, say we've got a plugin. I don't know if you can see it. A WP plugin with dependency. Um, it's got a dependency for WP Job Manager. So if that's found, it does regular stuff. If not, it just hooks into admin notices. And then for the dependency notice code, we're just um, getting an install link for the Job Manager plugin. Um, I put in the actual notice text. In this case, it says plugin with dependency requires WP Job Manager to plugin uh, to function, um, and a button. And with this code, if you didn't have Job Manager installed, it will show you this notice in admin uh, with a handy install button. Um, simple change, but potentially a big impact for users who aren't familiar. So next thing, I introduce features. So this can allow you to get users excited about um, features before they've actually had a chance to find them or use them. And helps keep them engaged. Um, if, setup, it's, if setup is complex, it can reassure them that it's all worth it. Um, an example of introducing features would be through custom welcome screens. Um, we use these in WooCommerce mostly after updates, but they essentially just list um, all the new features so users are aware of what's changed. Um, yeah. EDD does something similar on their What's New page after activation and updates. Um, they also have a getting started tab for new users to get a little bit more help um, when they've installed the plugin. Uh, another way of introducing features would be through the use of pointers. Um, these have been around since WordPress 3.3, and they're used to point out new features in core. Um, to use these in your plugins, you just have to enqueue the WP pointer scripts and styles using code like this. 
and then you output the pointer using JavaScript. Um, so in this code snippet, we're pointing at the insert media button element. We're giving it the content uh, shown there. And we're positioning the actual pointer in the top left. Um, and when that's open, it would just look something like this. So yeah, if you use pointers, um, do try to prevent them loading multiple times because you don't want to show the same user the same pointer over and over and over again. Um, so you can store like the status in the options table or only show pointers when a certain query string um, variable is present. And in general, just try not to overwhelm the user with pointers because we, no one wants to see point deception. <laughs> Um, so speaking more about pointers, they can also be useful for product tours um, by chaining them. Um, we've got an example of this. This is the WordPress SEO plugin, which has uh, a tour with pointers. Um, so after you activate, it will say, do you want to start a tour? Yes. And then it will just go through all the admin screens and explain what each one does in a pointer. Um, we have something similar in WooCommerce. So when you create your first product, it will um, point to all the various settings on the page and the meta boxes and explain what each one does as you go through. Um, so it gives the, the user a quick guide through product creation and hopefully um, makes them self-sufficient so they can do it themselves in the future. And this leads on to educate and during usage. So most of the time, educate and during usage is the best way for people to learn. Um, to quote Aristotle, for the things we have to do, for the things we have to learn before we do them, we learn by doing them. So an example of this would be contextual help. So I'm um, just explaining options and settings in your actual plugin in context. So um, this is an example from WooCommerce. We explain what the SKU field means in context in the tooltip. Um, you can also use, I uh, briefly mentioned, empty states. Um, this is uh, what you show when there's no content. Um, some of the books said, um, blank states are an opportunity for you to provide a warm and human experience to your product instead of literally saying, your dashboard is empty and that's all I'm going to say. So a very simple example would be in, say, a forms plugin. The top one doesn't have an empty state. The bottom one does. The bottom one says, you don't have any forms, let's go create one. And to me, that's much more helpful for a, a first-time user. Um, you can also use help tabs. So this is... Um, just a help tab from the post screen in WordPress. You open the little link in the top right and it will tell you about the screen you're on. Um, you can add contextual help to any admin page. Um, there's a current screen action you hook in. Um, you can compare your screen ID to the current screen ID and if it match, add a help tab. So you give it an ID, a title and some content. Um, this example would give you something like that. So you see the titles over here, the contents here and it would be on the screen you define. Uh, we use help tabs in WooCommerce as well. Um, we actually show videos in context as well. So if you're on, say, the ship and set and screen in this example, it will give you a video relevant to what you're looking at. Um, the videos themselves, useful to some users, easy to make, um, but they can be a little bit boring if they're long and tedious, and the user might not remember everything by the end of the video. Um, so if you have a complex plugin, you may want to consider um, something like an interactive walkthrough. Um, you can do this with a plugin called Sidekick. Um, they offer interactive demos for WordPress and WooCommerce at the moment. And after uh, the end users install Sidekick, they get a Help Me button in the bottom left. They can choose a walkthrough. And it will basically just give a, a voiceover and tell the user what to do, what to click, and explain everything in context. And um, yeah, for complex plugins, this is really helpful. Next we can try to offer an intuitive UI. Um, so by this I mean offering something that's easy to understand and hopefully self-explanatory. Um, Everett McKay defined it as being, when target users understand its behavior and effect without use of reason, memorization, experimentation, existence, or training. Um, this is pretty broad, and most of the examples I've given earlier kind of apply here as well, but um, you, could, you could also consider um, following WordPress um, UI, des uh, UI and design patterns. So, <coughs> If you follow the UI of WordPress, if a user's word, used WordPress before, and then they go to use a plugin that uses similar UI elements, then they're going to be more familiar with it overall. Um, you should never rely on a user manual to explain something, so you can offer the contextual help. You can use clear, concise wording in descriptions. Um, you can move, remove distractions and simplify. Um, for example, the custom Metabox uh, thing we <laughs> I talked about earlier. 
and you can make processes as efficient as possible. Um, so an example of making processes more, more efficient, um, we can look at ninja forms. Um, a few versions back, their form builder looked like this. Um, so it's basically just a set and screen. It doesn't look like a form builder. If you think about forms, the most important thing are the fields, um, but that's kind of buried away, hidden. Um, not very friendly. Um, James Laws from WP Ninja said, the biggest problem is that I'm not sure if it's very intuitive as to what users should do next. Do they go to the next tab? Is the name field set and clear enough? Um, so they revised the entire process and uh, made the product, their form builder look like this. So the fields are now on the first step. and It looks much more like a form builder. Um, those settings that were there previously are now hidden on a tab. And yeah, it's just generally more clear and efficient. Um, another example from WooCommerce 2.4 was the flat rate shipping. Um, flat rate shipping is for offering a, sing, a simple flat rate to ship a product or order. And somehow on the way to 2.3, we bloated it into this. Um, so it's got like cost per order, additional costs, handling fees, add-on rates, um, all very overwhelming for a, a first-time user. Uh, don't really know how anyone could use that. <laughs> so we removed all the fields and just kept it simple and added the cost field. So if you add a flat rate shipping method, you can immediately see your cost goes in that box. And we did keep functionality intact for the advanced users. Um, it's explained under the tooltip. Um, it allows maths. So you can do some logic like this. So in this example, we're doing 100 times, 10 times the quantity of items in the cart. So they've still got all the power from the previous version, but for, for the new users who just see this cost field, it's much more easy to understand. Um, and for us, it makes it easier to maintain and support if needed. Final thing today is to help users um, with one-time setup. Um, so help users to set up a plugin for the first time so they can actually get to use it faster and see what it does. Um, if you don't do this, especially if it's a complex plugin, users could give up um, because complex setup processes um, scale away users. So guide, simplify, or aut automate when possible. Um, and also guiding through one time, with one-time setup isn't just for beginners because it can be a time saver for anyone, anyone even if you're a developer. Um, so a quick example of this, um, in WP Job Manager, um, there's a setup wizard. So after you activate, it redirects you to a um, screen where you can just install the pages and the short codes. It does it all for you. Um, before I did this, I used to get a lot of support on the forums about um, what short codes to use, um, how do I use short codes, what pages do I create, people using the short codes incorrectly when they can't even copy and paste. And this just eliminated all the need for that support. Um, it's cut it out all overnight. And at the end, it offers next steps as well. So it tells you what they can do next. Um, you can actually see the code for this via this link. I'll put the, the notes on my website afterwards. Um, so a more, more advanced example of uh, a setup wizard is in uh, WooCommerce 2.4, which we introduced, I think, last month. Um, before we did this, one of the first screens a user would see in WooCommerce would be the setting screen. And as you can see, it's pretty long. There's tabs everywhere. It's not clear which settings the user needs to set up first. Um, some settings are hidden. Um, so we, we basically just redirected to a setup screen after activation, um, which explains what's going to happen in clear terms. It's not showing up very well on this. <laughs> Um, yeah, it offers a clear path to completion. Um, it avoids complex terminology, so we don't use words like taxonomy, term, plugin, um, loop, or words which mean nothing to the average user. And um, when the user runs through this, it basically just takes them through all the important settings, so the pages and short codes. Uh, it takes them through their locale, so it geolocates them and offers them like intelligent defaults, so it's all done for them. Um, it helps you set up basic shipping and tax rates. Um, so go through it. And then you can set up some simple payment gateways, the ones that come bundled with WooCommerce, so PayPal and some offline gateways. And then on the final step, it just tells you your store is ready because you've gone through all the key setup required and um, gives you the main call to action as being create your first product. And that would actually take the user to the uh, pointer-based interface for creating a product um, we showed earlier. 
So yeah, much more um, easy to use for beginners because it actually tells them what settings are required and yeah. So wrapping up, you don't need to use all of these things, um, just what you need. Um, you should try to put yourself in your user's shoes, um, see where they actually struggle. Uh, think about the steps users need to take between activating and successfully using your plugin and then try to simplify that process. And then look at ways to help them proactively rather than reactively. And you need to remember... Did that work? No. Nope. If an end user cannot understand the fundamentals of using your plugin, you have failed, not them. I'm done. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> or you can use like uh, notifications, and then you will get pretty much aggressive feedback from experienced users that it is annoying to them. Yeah. So how how to reconcile the need to get this in front of new users, but not alienate experienced users while at it? Like what you, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, my thoughts. So. I agree this is a problem because, as we've seen with like the recent um, like Barry's plugin, which hides notices for advanced users, um, they are annoying to some advanced users, yeah. Um, but I think the, the <coughs> benefits of showing these like shortcuts and um, uh, links to setting screens, for example, for new users kind of outweigh that because we're like the 1%. So um, for WooCommerce, for example, I mean, mostly it's going to be end users who um, struggle with this kind of thing rather than developers who get annoyed by this kind of thing. So I think it's better to make it prominent and just kind of ignore. The developers. That's my thoughts anyway. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay.